our, um, our moderator suggested to the panel that we should include a personal anecdote uh, regarding our connections with China. Uh, looking around the room here, I suspect that I'm one of the few people, perhaps even the only person, who actually met Deng Xiaoping uh, in Beijing in 1979. He had a quick wit and an ironic turn of mind, both of which are great attributes for politicians of all kinds. I was the uh, senior State Department representative on a delegation led by uh, our Secretary of Commerce, who at that time was a gracious woman and a trained economist called Juanita Kreps, and she was expounding to Deng the importance for economic development uh, of an effective legal system and the appropriate laws that would govern uh, business behavior. It was really a short lecture, uh, valid but a little pedantic. Uh, Dung listened patiently and then responded by saying that he agreed with her that China had too few laws, but he went on to say that America has far too many lawyers. <laughs> this was during the period of normalization of relations between China and the United States, and one of the things that China wanted out of normalization was what is called most favored nation treatment. That means that China's goods coming into the United States would not pay a, pay a tariff that was higher than the tariff paid by, uh, by other goods. Um, uh, so did the Soviet Union in roughly the same period. And in 1974, Congress added to our basic tariff law what's called the Jackson-Vanik Amendment, which stated that to qualify for MFN, as it's called, treatment by the United States, a country had to allow emigration. This amendment was aimed at the Soviet Union, which sharply restricted migration out of the Soviet Union. Um, but it's offensive to name a country in another country's law, and so the law was written uh, uh, to cover all non-market economies. Of course, in 1979, China was a non-market economy, and China was thus caught up uh, by this law, and it fell uh, to an, an unfortunate senior White House official to explain this legal necessity to Deng during his visit to Washington. And Deng, Deng again listened patiently and attentively, and then responded to this explanation of the need to uh, allow uh, for emigration from China, he said, how many do you want, 10 or 20 million? Thus exposing Congress's hypocrisy on the issue of uh, immigration. Now, this marks a good segue, I think, to our topic, can China lead? Just as emigrants have to have a place to which to uh, immigrate, uh, leaders have to have followers. And so we can rephrase the question, our topic today, uh, to read, who will China's followers be? Here we have to distinguish between different kinds of leadership, and I just want to make a twofold distinction. One is leadership by initiative, which in turn can be done either through persuasion or through coercion or the threat of coercion, and leadership by example. In my view, is that in general, China is not yet ready for leadership by initiative, although I'm going to qualify that uh, at the end of my remarks. But China already has many followers in its leadership by example. And I will focus only on, only on one, uh, but it's a very important one, and it's one that may actually surprise you. A little bit of history, recent history, I don't go as far back as uh, either Bill Kirby or, or Peter Bowles, but in the 1960s and 70s and into the 80s, it was standard doctrine in the non-aligned movement led by India and Indonesia and Yugoslavia and influencing many developing countries and their diplomatic spokesmen in the United Nations in a group called the G77, that the international economic system as it then existed 
and was laid down by the Allies during and immediately following the Second World War and is embodied in such uh, uh, institutions as the International Monetary Fund and the General Agreement on Tariff and Trade, GATT, uh, that it was favor strongly favored rich countries and it was stacked against poor countries. And this was a litany which uh, anyone on the diplomatic circuit heard again and again and again coming from de developing countries. And uh, uh, it led many countries to turn inward in their economic policies. The uh, People's Republic of China was a complete outsider to this system and indeed had deliberately turned inward under Mao Zedong who distrusted foreign entang entanglements of any kind. Under Deng, uh, China undertook, slowly at first, gradually more rapidly, a radical change in policy, joined the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, and encouraged foreign trade and investment. And it succeeded smashingly. China's growth rate spurted up in the 1980s, as we saw earlier this morning. Other countries took notice. China's early success completely pulled the rug out from under the doctrinaire G77 position, often led intellectually by India. One developing country after another, including Mexico in 1986 and even India in 1991, radically altered their policies toward foreign trade and investment and toward macroeconomic management and inflation and ushered in per periods of higher economic growth there also. China's lead, showing that a complete outsider could successfully exploit the, uh, through a change in its own policies, the economic opportunities that were available in the existing international economic system, did much more, in my view, to produce what's called the Washington Consensus, which was first characterized in 1990 with respect to Latin American countries, than years of haranguing by Reagan administration officials. I think it was the actual example of China that led one country after another around the world to review its own policies and ask whether they were really on the right path and often answering, no, we are not on the right path. Other countries continue to watch developments in China carefully and the wise ones learn from China, including from China's occasional mistakes or false steps. And so in this respect, China continues to lead by example, if not by initiative. Now, can China lead by initiative? It has to be said that China has not behaved in a way to endear itself to its neighbors and many of its trading partners. It has a mixed record and it is still viewed in some places with suspicion. But there is at least one area, I believe, where the world would be well served by Chinese leadership, both by example and by initiative, and that has to do with climate change. Example would have to precede initiative, I think, but China has a vigorous declaratory policy for dealing with pollution and with greenhouse gas emissions even now. If this policy were seen around the world actually to be executed with vigor and with real results, I think China would be in a strong position to lead by initiative in an area where the world needs leadership and where the United States, because of its own dysfunctional politics fed by self-interested skepticism, cannot persuasively lead. Thank you.